This is Talk Business and Politics with Roby Brock. Welcome to the program. I'm Roby Brock. We appreciate you joining us for this edition of Talk Business and Politics Daily. Day eight of the 94th General Assembly in Arkansas. It has been a slow moving week as bills are being filed, but not a lot of committee action. That's not uncommon for the start of a legislative session. Governor Sarah Sanders making two high profile appointments in the last 24 hours, as well as reversing a legal position uh, from former Governor Asa Hutchinson. We'll share details about that. We've got Representative Stephen Meeks, who's filed two bills of interest. Uh, one deals with net metering, the other deals with uh, financial institutions. What's he trying to achieve with these particular uh, issues? All of this and more coming up on this edition of Talk Business and Politics Daily. Talk Business and Politics Daily is brought to you by Wright Lindsey Jennings Law Firm, Impact Management Group, and these sponsors. We proudly deliver reliable, affordable, responsible power across Arkansas. But demand for electricity is strained by the elimination of sources we need for always-on reliability. And adding intermittents like wind and solar cannot replace workhorses like coal and natural gas that we all count on. Power must be balanced for your needs and our mission. Reliable, affordable, responsible. We're the Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas. Connection. It's the heart of what we do. It's why we work to better the communities where we live and work. It's why we're expanding to get people connected and create digital equity programs that support affordable internet and digital literacy. We're leaders for positive change. From the way we empower our people, clients, and communities to the way we care for our planet, we live our values every day. We're Cox Communications, and we're pleased to connect with you. Together we can create in Arkansas that places children and families at the very top of the agenda. We can create the type of Arkansas that we have always imagined. Arkansas Advocates as an organization is the clue that can put all those families' voices together. Welcome back to the program. Joining me now, Representative Stephen Meeks, Republican of Greenbrier. He is the chairman of the Joint Advanced Communications and Information Technology Committee. He sits on education and state agencies as well. Uh, Representative Meeks, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me today. All right, let's begin with a bill that you filed, House Bill 1047. It's a net metering uh, bill. Uh, this deals with uh, solar power coming from a residence, wanting to put it back on the electrical grid here. Tell me what is the crux of what you're trying to accomplish with that bill? So um, in uh, the state of Arkansas, net metering, just for folks who are not familiar with it, what that involves is people who have solar panels on their roof, like you said, they send electricity out during the day when the sun is producing, and then at night they draw that power back out. And uh, there's been a lot of debate in the state and actually all over the nation about what's the right way to handle that power going back and forth to the utility. Um, under our current situation, uh, the Public Service Commission had a one-for-one -one rate, which means I would give a kilowatt to the utility. In return, the utility gives a kilowatt back to me. The uh, uh, rules that kind of govern that expired at the end of last year, so at the end of December. And so there's been a lot of debate going on about how do we go forward from here? Uh, over the last couple of years, the solar industry has really taken off in Arkansas. And uh, my reason for wanting to file this bill is I wanna be able to protect that growth create a stable environment because as you know business hates uncertainty and right now there's a lot of uncertainty about what those exchange rates are going to look like so create some certainty and put it into law so that way if any changes need to be made in the future those changes are done here in the public at the legislative level and are debated and it only happens once every two years so that helps to create certainty within the industry, both for the utilities and for the residential solar customers. Okay. Um, let me let me correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that your bill requires the uh, utilities to pay the customer, the solar energy producing retail customers, um, the retail rate, which 
my understanding is about three times what the wholesale cost is. I just had Buddy Haston, CEO of uh, Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas on the a TV program this weekend. And he claims that that's not fair, that uh, that does not account for the costs that go in running the grid. Is Does he have a fairness point to you? Right, right. So that's a, a lot of where the challenge is at. But each one of us in our electric bills, we have a, a basic service charge. And in that service charge, it helps to cover some of the infrastructure costs, the the poles, the wires, the uh, the you know utility workers, and, and so forth. Um, some of that cost is also included in the kilowatt uh, rate that we all pay. So the idea is is that people who are using more electricity are going to cover more of that cost for the infrastructure. And under the current net metering rules, if you are giving and taking so that you zero out your bill at the end of the month that you're not covering your portion of the infrastructure. And then that cost then gets passed on to the other consumers. So in a roundabout way, those without solar are helping to subsidize those who have solar, which is, which is a valid argument. So the, 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 uh, thing that we're looking at now is I'm talking to both sides because I want to create something that's fair for everybody is how do we capture that expense in such a way that we keep the utilities whole so that we're not shifting that cost on to other people, but at the same time, making sure that the solar meter customer is compensated for the power and then also the benefit that they provide to the grid. Just a simple case in point. When I produce electricity, say on my house, and it goes to my neighbor's house, there's very little electrical loss through that line. Whereas when the power has to come from a power company, say in Russellville to Greenbrier, there's resistive loss in the line. So that, that loss to the utility is avoided. Plus by having solar uh, distributed throughout the grid, it helps to bring stability to the grid. So there's a lot of other advantages to solar that are very difficult to quantify. And that's a lot of where you see these arguments between the utilities and the solar people about what is that value there? How do we quantify it to make it fair for everybody? So uh, discussions are still ongoing. The, the bill at this point is basically just a placeholder to let everybody know that you know this is something that we do need to work on. Uh, I met with the utilities, I've talked with the solar folks. So uh, still a work in progress. It sounds like that this bill will be modified. <laughs> Let's move yes, on. Yes, yes, definitely. It will be modified. And uh, one of the other things I, I'm, along these lines that I'm talking to the utilities about is uh, adding storage as uh, some sort of incentive within this to help promote storage within the state. Because one of the challenges with solar is solar produces its peak amount of power usually between noon and two in the afternoon. But usage is usually at its highest when everybody starts getting at home, turning on the TVs and looking at their email between, you know, four or five, six o'clock. And that's also during the summer when it's at its hottest. So uh, you, you've got this shifting of time that needs to take place that batteries can help with. And so I'm trying to include that as part of the discussion, trying to promote solar trying to promote energy storage within the state, but also do it in a way that's fair to the utilities and fair to people who don't uh, explore these options. All right, House Bill 1049, the Fair Access to Financial Services Act. This bill has what I would describe as a lot of flowery freedom language in it, uh, which yes. you are entitled to do. Uh, right. But basically, if I'm reading this right, you're requiring financial institutions to not deny services um, to anyone based on non-financial or subjective criteria, right. which right. I feel like is already federal and state law. So what are you trying to accomplish in this bill? So uh, there's a, a move that's going on globally that's called ESG for short. It stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. And uh, these are a couple different groups that are, you know, unelected, unaccountable organizations that get together. They develop these standards. And then what they're trying to do is push these standards down in through the banking systems and all the way down into our small businesses and basically say that if you don't comply with these standards that we have set, then we're either not going to uh, provide financial services to you or else we're going to do so at a... Uh, less desirable rate. Uh, I had a, a constituent, for example, um, that came to me and said that they applied for a loan 
and there were questions on the loan that were related to the type of plumbing he had in his bathroom. So, you know, was he using uh, low flow uh, faucets? That has nothing to do with the financial viability of that business. And uh, in my mind, this is simply these groups who are not able to succeed politically in pushing these ideas, trying to manipulate people's behavior in order to give them access to capital. Uh, you see it a whole lot more in Europe than you do here in our country. And, uh, I, you know, these ideas are, in my view, an antithesis to a free market capitalist system. You should be judged upon your credit worthiness, not based upon some other criteria. Because if you start down this road, it becomes a very dangerous, slippery slope. We're gonna to get to the place sometime in the future where you know, someone doesn't like me because I'm a Republican and I'm a conservative, so they're not gonna give me a loan for a business. Um, we're starting to see some discrimination along those lines. I've heard examples in other states, and I don't want that to come to Arkansas. It needs to be a fair, uh, objective standard on uh, providing these services. You've taken a couple of leaps of logic there on me, but I'm going to, uh, we've got some time constraints here. I've tried to get a definition of ESG from a variety of sources, and it can mean anything from donating to a little league baseball team to you know, an example of what you referenced with, you know, uh, types of pipes in your house. I'm, I'm not, I think the definition of ESG is pretty vague at this point. And, right. And, um, and that's part of the problem is these standards are, who's making these standards? What criteria are they using? And so it, again, it it's, gets back to this confusion in business model. That is what I'm trying to avoid. Make it fair for everybody. Well, good luck legislating something that's clear as mud. Right, right, right. It, and again, that one's still a work in progress, too. All right. Uh, education. You're on the education committee. You've heard a lot yes, of what some of the overarching uh, pieces of an omnibus education bill will be uh, when it comes out. Are you okay with what you're hearing on education reform? Uh, so far, I am. Um, unfortunately, as you know, Arkansas lags behind the nation in a lot of our education metrics. And, uh, you know, they say, if you're not doing well and continuing doing the same thing over and over and again, expecting different results is not, not good. So um, I've been uh, very encouraged by what I've been hearing coming out of the governor's office. Uh, at this point, we've not seen any details yet on any of the uh, uh, announced programs. So uh, reserve final judgment until I see those details, but in, uh, in spirit, I do agree with uh, what the governor is trying to accomplish. Is there anything that would be a deal breaker for you in terms of if there's something that is is or is not in that omnibus education bill, mm -hmm. could it cause you to oppose it? Uh, I won't say that it wouldn't happen, but I don't have anything off the top of my head that said, hey, if the governor included X, Y, Z, I would no longer support that. Uh, it's just one of those things that I'll have to wait and see the details and make a call at that point. All right. Lastly, you're on the state agencies committee, uh, as I mentioned earlier, too. I don't think there's been any resolutions filed yet that would deal with constitutional amendments, which the state agencies committee uh, right. will look at referrals for that. Are there is there any conversation among your colleagues of potential proposals that you think might have some early favorite status? Uh, so I do have one and it's mine. Uh, the. Uh, 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 one that I proposed last time that it was fairly popular, but didn't quite eke over the finish line. I'm going to file it again. Uh, but what that uh, constitutional amendment will do, will it will allow the General Assembly to phase out personal property taxes. Uh, these are the taxes that we pay on our vehicles and other personal property. Uh, I've always been troubled by the fact that a car, so I used to live in Florida many, many, many years ago. I moved back to Arkansas because I, I grew up here, but I moved back to Arkansas brought a car from Florida that was bought in Florida, completely paid for in Florida, owed no taxes or anything on it, brought it here with me to Arkansas. And now year after year after year, I'm starting to have to pay taxes on that vehicle again. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly hefty lift, but um, I think it's something that we do need to, uh, do need to tackle. Uh, plus we have, and I can get into this from, from a business aspect is, it's detrimental to businesses that are uh, carrying personal property taxes. So for example, if we wanted an auto manufacturer to come to the state of Arkansas, during years where they were doing well, sending their inventory across the, the country so that at tax time, they only had a few vehicles on the lot, their tax would be low. But during lean years, when things are not selling well, 
they're going to have a lot of that inventory still in stock. So their tax is actually going to go up. So it, it's detrimental to businesses as well. It's the most expensive tax to collect. And so for a lot of reasons, I think it would be beneficial to our state to phase out over time and to get rid of this tax. All right. Philosophical question for you here. If you, eliminate, if you eliminate the income tax, the individual and corporate income tax, you eliminate the property tax and we eliminate the sales tax, which a lot Not of the property are tax, the personal the, property tax. So yes, personal that, property. What, what are we going to have to support public schools and prisons and everything else that our tax base supports? So uh, like in, in my example, um, and I don't know that we would act, would would do this, but if you took the personal property tax, that uh, income and shifted it over to just a straight property tax, then the overall burden to the average Arkansan would go down. Now it would vary by person to person, but the state could still collect the same income but because it was a much more subjective tax and a whole lot easier to collect and distribute, the cost of collecting that tax would decline. And so you could still have the same impact to the, the state coffers, but at a much cheaper rate to our citizens. So that's one way you could do it. But yes, you're right. We do still need to collect sales tax and other taxes to be able to perform our uh, duties as a, a government. So. Uh, unfortunately, taxes are a necessary evil, and we do need to have some, but some taxes are better than others. All right, Representative Stephen Meeks, Republican of Greenbrier, appreciate you being with us, and uh, I will see you in the Capitol corridors up there soon. Thank you for having me today. All right, we're back with more right after this. Talk Business and Politics Daily is brought to you by Wright Lindsay Jennings Law Firm, Capital Advisors Group and these sponsors. One of the things that I really liked about UAMS College of Health Professions is that they set me up for success. I chose UAMS because I felt like it was a great place to work. My grandmother was diagnosed at UAMS for multiple myeloma and I felt like it would be a great way to pay back the place that helped my grandmother so much. And that's why I went in the healthcare field in the first place, is to help someone just like they've helped my grandmother. For your education and healthcare needs, Choose UAMS. This is what we work for. The moments you live for. The joy. The heart. The wonder. At Entergy, we're dedicated to powering each moment. Today and for future generations. So we're leading the way with a cleaner, more reliable power grid to power every day. Because these moments matter. We power life. Entergy. Well, Governor Sarah Sanders made two high-profile appointments over the last 24 hours. First of all, Steve Landers, who ran for Little Rock Mayor, was reappointed to the Arkansas Racing Commission. That board oversees horse racing and casinos in the state. Monticello businessman Mike Aiken named to the State Police Commission. Also, Governor Sanders reversed the official position of the governor's office on the constitutionality of Arkansas's ban on mask mandates by public entities. A case before the Arkansas Supreme Court is arguing if the executive branch can make this decision or if the policy decision making belongs to the legislature. Sanders siding with the legislature on this one, a reversal of position from former Governor Asa Hutchinson. And finally, Mike Preston, the former Arkansas Secretary of Commerce and head of the AEDC, will start a new division for investment banking firm Stevens Inc. Preston will start a new site and incentive advisory practice to help businesses navigating complex incentive programs and expansion opportunities. And you can catch all of these stories and much more on our website at talkbusiness.net. That is all for today's edition of Talk Business and Politics Daily. I'm Roby Brock. As always, we appreciate you tuning in. We'll see you next time.